Hi. Um, my name is Jason Head. I am a professor of vertebrate evolution and ecology in the Department of Zoology and the Museum of Zoology here at the University of Cambridge. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Um, very quickly, before I do that, though, there is a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first thing is that there are no uh, fire alarms anticipated today for those of you in the room. So let's hope there are no unanticipated alarms either. Uh, and then for everyone online, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom Q&A and we will answer them for or we'll ask them for you. So today's guest presenter is uh, Mr. Tom Jameson. Tom is a PhD candidate in my laboratory in the Department of Zoology and in the museum. Um, Tom received his uh, part two degree uh, in the department in 2016 with FIRST. He then uh, a year later finished his master's degree or his MPhil degree in my laboratory working on the topic he'll be speaking about today. Uh, he then took a year off and decided to go do some conservation herpetology work at the Chester Zoo and then came back to do his PhD. Um, at Cambridge, we're used to getting very bright students who show up and are somewhat unfocused in terms of what they wanna do. Tom was a little different. Tom showed up with what would be an appropriate postgraduate degree project as an undergraduate in my lab and said, can I do this here? And I of course said, why, yes, you can, absolutely. Um, in that, since that time, Tom has been a central figure in my lab over the past seven years. He has done everything from learn machine learning uh, techniques to analyzing large data sets to for his current project, and I'm not making this up, going out in the field in Australia and taking decomposing rats and squeezing them to get all of the parasitic worms out of them and all the larvae to actually estimate the effects of lizard population density on carrion on the landscape and how that might actually affect sheep production. So that gives you some sense of the breadth and depth of Tom's work. He's absolutely brilliant. And today he is going to be presenting on his work on tiny frogs. Tom? Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Jason. Uh, so yes, tiny frogs, housekeeping, et cetera. Uh, so very happy to be here today talking to you about one of my very favorite topics, teeny tiny frogs, and some of the work that I and Jason's lab um, completed where that we published quite recently, where we actually discovered Mexico's smallest frogs. So we all probably already know that tropical forests teem and buzz with life. But what you might not know is that these forests hold a secret. Down in the forest floor, there hides a hidden world, a Lilliputian ecology of teeny tiny species we know almost nothing about, and that were only recently started to, to discover. And so today I'm gonna to talk about some of these denizens of the leaf litter, specifically tiny frogs and Mexico's tiniest frogs. So we'll start off with a bit of a background about what is a tiny frog, why frogs get so small, some of the science behind how we actually discover species before talking in detail about our work on Mexico's smallest frogs. So first off, what is a tiny frog? What do we mean by tiny frogs scientifically? And here we're talking about organisms which are miniaturized. Miniaturization is a size reduction beyond the threshold at which dramatic changes in morphology, physiology and ecology occur. So here we're talking about organisms that relative to their ancestors are so small that the way their body looks has changed dramatically, their morphology. The way that body works has changed dramatic dramatically, the physiology, and the way those bodies interact with the environment around them, their ecology has changed. And so for tiny frogs, we're talking about organisms maxing out at around 20 millimeters total body length. So here, if you have, take a look at your thumb and your thumbnail, we're looking at frogs that could happily sit upon your thumbnail. And so let's look at some examples of tiny frogs that come from around the world. So you can't talk about small frogs without talking about the world's very smallest frog, Pedophryne amanuensis. This guy measures in at around 7.7 .7 millimeters long total body length and comes from the highland forests of Papua New Guinea. And not only is this the world's smallest frog, it's in fact the world's smallest tetrapod. So the world's smallest limbed vertebrate, the world's smallest limbed animal with a backbone, and so of all the amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals, this is the very, very smallest. There's maybe a couple of species of very small fish that win the prize of the world's smallest vertebrate, but this is the world's smallest tetrapod. But we don't just find tiny frogs in the highland forests of Papua New Guinea, we find them actually all over the world. So some other examples of tiny frogs I'd like to highlight for you. One group with a really fantastic name, the genus Mini, made up of three species, Mini Mum, Mini Skule and Mini Ature. Very appropriately named. So these guys again described quite recently in 2019 and they all measure in at around 10 millimeters long total body length. So these guys again come from the forest floor, come from the leaf litter this time of Madagascar. 
If we go across the sea to the Atlantic rainforest of Brazil, we also find small species of frog there. One of my favorite species of frog, Brachycephalus epithidium, otherwise known as the pumpkin toadlet, so named for its, its beautiful orange coloration. And so we find tiny frogs in Brazil, in Papua New Guinea, um, in Madagascar as well. And we actually find them pretty much anywhere in the world that we have tropical rainforests. And so this map shown in green here, this is the world's tropical rainforests. And in all these regions, we're finding different species of tiny frogs. Now, these species aren't closely related. Most of them are actually very distantly related, but they've all independently evolved this very small body size um, from larger ancestors. And so what other features do they share alongside small body size? So as has been mentioned already, all these frogs have a very similar ecology. They all share the same ecological niche. They all behave in the environment in the same kind of way. They're all living in the leaf litter and eating all the animals that decompose that leaf litter, all the different insects and myriapods and mollusks and things that feed on those dead leaves. Our tiny frogs, wherever they are in the world, are doing the same kind of thing in that leaf litter. All our tiny frogs also develop in the same kind of way. They're what we call direct developers. So you're probably familiar with how most frogs develop. We have our egg, our frog spawn, and then that hatches into a larval stage that we usually call a tadpole. And that tadpole then metamorphoses into an adult frog. But all our tiny frogs are direct developers. So they hatch from the egg as a fully formed frog. They skip that larval stage. Now, if you're looking very closely at those pictures of example tiny frogs I threw up on the screen, you might have noticed something strange about the hands and feet. And if you're looking very closely, you might have seen that we have these rather strange stubby hands and feet. We don't have that full complement of fingers and toes we would expect. We have what look like not fully formed fingers and toes. And if we think about these frogs, they're very, very small and parts of their body look like they aren't fully formed. They also almost look somewhat embryonic. And this gives us a bit of a clue into the evolution of these small species. And what we think is going on here is this process called heterochrony. So this is through evolution, a changing in the timing and or rate of developmental processes underlying the formation of these morphological traits. And specifically, we're looking at something called pedomorphosis or neoteny. And this is where the development of traits in a descendant species are truncated relative to the ancestral species. Put more simply, our descendant species look like juveniles of their ancestors. And so something you might be familiar with is the axolotl. This is a species of salamander from Mexico. And this is an adult axolotl, but it retains some juvenile characteristics. It retains these larval external feathery gills. It retains this big swimming tail that we usually associate with larva. And so this is what we call this pedomorphosis. And that's probably what we think goes on with our tiny frogs as well. They're retaining these juvenile characteristics of a really, really small, small body size and unformed um, not fully formed limbs. So a bit of a background on the what of tiny frogs. We then might ask why tiny frogs? Why do they get so small? What is driving the evolution of small body size amongst these frogs if they're evolving from larger ancestors? And the answer to that appears to lie within the leaves, specifically that there's lots of advantages to living beneath the leaf litter. And so there's a strong selective pressure to get very small in order to be able to access this leaf litter realm. So these advantages include protection from predators. Leaves might not look like they provide a lot of protection from a predator, but actually the leaf litter is a complicated three-dimensional environment. If you're a small frog, it provides lots of different nooks and crannies to hide in from the birds and mammals and reptiles that might be trying to eat you. Leaf litter is also a really nice high humidity environment as well. So if you've ever walked through a forest, even on a dry day, if you stick your hand down into the leaf litter, you'll find it's all damp and warm down there. And so this high humidity environment is really useful if you're a small frog. Frogs have very permeable skin, so in dry conditions, they're constantly losing moisture to the environment. And so lots of amphibians are very, very closely tied to water sources like rivers and lakes and ponds. But if you've got a nice high humidity environment like you have beneath the leaves, you can freely move through that environment without too much worry of drying out. There's also lots of food sources in leaf litter as well. So there's all these animals eating these leaves, our various insects, our little snails and slugs and things. And so if you like to eat all those sort of things, if you're a tiny frog that likes to eat snails and insects, there's a lot of food beneath the leaf litter as well. So all these advantages to living beneath the leaf litter, providing a selective pressure to evolve small body size if you're a frog. So Background on tiny frogs, what about discovering species? What is the science of discovering species? And how did we go about discovering our small species of frogs from Mexico? 
So you might think that we've discovered all the species there are to discover, but this actually couldn't be further from the truth. We are constantly discovering new species. And so what this rather complicated graph here shows is the fact that this is showing the cumulative number of species described through time. So we have, since records began, since we started describing species in the 1700s, up until today, the cumulative number of total species described by scientists. Now, if we discovered all the species there were to find, we would expect these lines to start to level off as our cumulative number of species starts to, starts to plateau out as we found everything there is to find. But you can see these lines are on a pretty solid upward trajectory. And so the paper this is taken from, a classic paper by Costello et al from 2012, they carried out some complicated maths on these rates of species discovery, and they calculated that we have about 2 million species on Earth. And that means that we have roughly 30% of all marine and all terrestrial species still left to discover. So literally hundreds of thousands of species we're yet to find. And there is nowhere that this is more true than amongst frogs. We are really living in a golden age of frog discovery. So we have almost 7,500 species of frogs described worldwide. And for the last 10 years, we've been pretty consistently describing 150 new species of frogs. So uh, the title of Mexico's smallest frog, discovering new species of frog might sound very exciting, but we actually discover new species of frogs all the time. Um, so why so many new species of frogs? Why, what is it about frogs that means that we've not found so many of them in the past and we're finding so many now? And this appears to relate to biases in the way science has been done historically and how it's changing now, leading to high rates of frog species discovery. So most frogs are found in tropical regions. They have a real tropic centric distribution, whereas most science of species discovery has historically been done in temperate regions in Europe and North America, away from these regions. And so less work has been done in these tropical regions, less work on discovering species. And so animals with lots of species in these regions tend to have been described less. This has changed a lot recently with the establishment of a lot of scientific centers in tropical regions that are doing fantastic work of cataloging their own biodiversity. Simple things like natural history of an animal can also affect the rate at which we discover them. So most frogs are nocturnal. It's harder to see things at night. There's fewer people around to bump into things at night. And something as simple as this can stymie how we're describing species. So nocturnal species, again, have lower rates of species discovery historically. But that's starting to change now. Small species also tend to have been described less. And so it's much uh, harder to miss an elephant than it is a small frog. And so small things tend to have been described less historically. In this talk, we're talking about really, really small frogs. So they historically have been missed. They've been overlooked because they're just harder to find, harder to see. So simple things like this can affect the rate at which we've just been, been describing species in the past. We also have the issue of cryptic species amongst amphibians and amongst frogs. So what are cryptic species? So cryptic species are where we have two or more distinct species that have been wrongly classified under a single species name. And so we might have what we think was one very widespread species, but on closer inspection, we actually find that it was several um, distinct populations, several different species that just looked quite similar. And we've discovered a lot of cryptic species in recent years. And this is mainly due to the advent of accessible genetic technology, our ability to sequence the genes of species. And so with the advent of accessible DNA technology, particularly the introduction of PCR, our DNA amplification, making sequencing of DNA much easier in the 1980s and 1990s, this has led to a real jump in the description of cryptic species. So what we have on this graph here is um, the percentage of peer-reviewed articles that mention cryptic species shown there in blue. And this is a pretty good proxy for how much work is being done on our cryptic species. So we can see since the 1980s and 90s, this work has really exploded. We're having lots and lots of people describing cryptic species, discovering cryptic species. So we're discovering all sorts of new species all the time, and particularly we were discovering lots and lots of species of frog. And so now let's get into the real nitty gritty of what we did, the work we did here at Cambridge in the University Museum of Zoology, where we discovered Mexico's smallest frogs. And so first off, we should probably introduce which frogs we're actually talking about here. If we're talking about frogs from Mexico, and Mexico is a really, really important place for amphibians. We have almost 400 species of amphibians from Mexico, making it meaning that Mexico has the fifth largest amphibian fauna of any country in the world. And almost 70% of those species are endemic. And that means that they're not found anywhere else in the world except for in Mexico. So Mexico, Mexico has the third most endemic amphibian species in the world. 
So Mexico is a really, really important place for amphibians globally. And we can visualize this diversity of amphibians in Mexico from our map here. And what this shows is the species richness of amphibians in Mexico. And so our cool colors, our blues and our whites here, uh, these represent where we have low amphibian diversity, and those warmer colors, our greens and our reds, represent where we have a high amphibian richness, where there's lots of different amphibians living close together. As you can see that the majority of amphibian richness in Mexico is centered in the south of the country and centered on the west coast of Mexico. So of all our 400 species of Mexican amphibians, colleagues and I were focused mainly just on one group. And that's what we call the Craugaster mexicanus species series, a group of six rather small inoffensive frogs uh, from the west coast of South Mexico. Um, and we, this has what we thought were six species, four of which relatively large. We have Craugaster mexicanus, Craugaster miltomanus, Craugaster montanus, and Craugaster sultata, all measuring in at roughly four centimeters or so total body length and two much smaller species, Craugaster hobot smithi and Craugaster pygmaeus, much, much smaller at around 12 millimeters long total body length. So these are Craugaster frogs. They're part of the genus Craugaster. Craugaster means fleshy belly because all these frogs have these big fat stomach discs. They look like they've got big fat tummies. Um, and the common name for these frogs is dirt frogs, which might sound quite cruel, but is actually very, uh, and a very appropriate name for these frogs. So they're small and brown, so they, live, uh, so they look like dirt, and they live in the leaf litter, they live on the ground, so they live in the dirt as well. And some of these species are phenomenally common where they occur, so they're actually common as dirt too. So two of our, two, two of our species shown here, Craugaster mexicanus and Craugaster pygmaeus, both have really, really big population sizes. In the forests in which they occur, the leaf litter is teeming with these frogs, potentially millions and millions of frogs within a couple of square kilometers, a couple of square miles. And this makes these frogs really ecologically important. They're down there in the leaf litter and everything that can is eating them. So all our amphibians, our birds and our reptiles, all our different animals are eating these frogs. There's forests in Mexico where the entire food chain is based on these frogs. So ecologically really, really important. Whereas some of our species here are really common, some of them are actually really wet rare. So Craugaster montanus, Craugaster saltata shown at the bottom there, both of these are endangered species. So you have a group of frogs where some are really common, really ecologically important, some appear to be very, very endangered too. And we also have an issue that we don't know what's going on with the diversity of this group. We recognize that there are these six described species of frogs, but when colleagues and I had been looking in museums around the world where we had these specimens of frogs floating in our jars of alcohol, we had lots of um, them labeled that um, <clears throat> lots of these frogs labeled with part of the Mexicanus group, but which species we don't know. So a lot of unassigned specimens. People had found these in the wild and we found something that we knew was part of this group, but we couldn't clearly assign it to any of our six recognized species. And this suggests to us that we have undescribed diversity within this group. We potentially have undescribed species. And so that's what we wanted to go ahead and do was to try and describe some of these new species, try and catalog the diversity of this group, try and understand the diversity of this group. So we took what's called an integrative taxonomic approach. And this is just a fancy way of saying we looked at lots of different independent lines of evidence to try and catalog diversity in this group. And we did this mainly by looking at museum specimens. So we have our beautifully drawn museum specimen up here. And we didn't just look at one museum specimen. We actually looked at 461, which represented every single frog from this group in any museum from all around the world. So we contacted all the museums in the world that held specimens of these frogs. And we asked them very nicely if they could send them to us. And they pretty much all said yes. And so we spent several weeks in the Museum of Zoology in Cambridge, uh, receiving by airmail jars and jars of tiny, tiny frogs. And so we have all our specimens of frogs, and then we want to do some research on them. We want to try and figure out what's going on with the biodiversity. We want to try and figure out how our different specimens correspond to different species. And so the first thing we want to look at here was the genetics. So we extract DNA from our specimens, we sequence that DNA, and then we can see how our different specimens are related to each other based on that DNA as well. We also want to look at their external morphology. So we crack out our magnifying glasses and I spent hours hunched over a desk looking at these teeny tiny frogs, looking at things like counting the number of warts on each of their hands, looking at the head shape, looking at the body patterns, looking at all the different features that make these specimens different. So as well as cataloging our specimens based on their genetics, we can also categorize them based on how they look externally. 
We also got out our measuring tapes and did some rather complicated maths on these frogs. So we measured all the different features of the body. We measured how wide the head is and how long the head is, all the lengths of all the different limbs. And that allows us to reduce each of our frogs to a rather complicated mathematical equation. And then we can carry out some complicated maths on all of those equations and we can figure out how our frogs differ in terms of size and shape mathematically, another way of categorizing our specimens. We also took a subsample of our frogs and we threw them inside a CT scanner, not a medical CT scanner like this, but we actually have a rather special CT scanner over in the Museum of Zoology in the Cambridge Biotomography Center. So we could CT scan our frogs and get beautiful three dimensional images of their skeletons. And so that allows us as well as comparing them based on external morphology, we can also look internally, see how these frogs differ internally as well. So we have all our different lines of evidence so what did we find? What did all of this work produce? So our, our main finding was we discovered six species new to science. And what this rather complicated graphic shows are those six new species. So this is our phylogeny based on our genetic data. Basically what this is, is a family tree of relatedness based on those genes we looked at. And so the ends of these branches, these rather this set of letters and numbers represent our individual specimens and how closely those different specimens branch represents how closely related they are based on the genes we looked at. And all you need to take away from that that we have here in Peach, those previously described species, those six previously described species, but we also described, uh, we also found um, six species new to science shown there in green. And so these are those new species. So we identified our new species um, <clears throat> we identify our new species, we then have to go ahead and describe them. We have to look at all our specimens, we have to see what makes this species a species, we describe them so people in the future can identify those frogs. And part of that process is giving them a name. So we then had the task of naming our new species of frog. So to take you through, we had Craugaster bitonium, bi two tonium toned. As you can see, this is a beautiful two-toned frog. It's got a nice brown and gold two-tone coloration. That's quite distinct for this species. Hence, that's the name we picked. We also had Craugaster candelariensis, candelariensis of candelaria. This frog comes from the region of candelaria. But more than that, this is actually a very appropriate name because we found that these frogs' skin reacted quite strangely in the formula in an alcohol we store the museum specimens in. And actually, when these frogs have been stored in that formula in an alcohol, their skin went a funny texture and they started to look like they were made out of wax. So all these specimens actually looked like tiny candles. Hence, the name Candelariensis was particularly appropriate. Probably my favorite name we came up with for these frogs was Craugaster coyatl. Koyatl means frog in the indigenous language Nakhluit, which is the language that's been speak, spoken in the valley that these frogs come from since before the 15th century. This is an Aztec indigenous language. And so this name is a reference to that rich human uh, history from this region. From our most creative name to our least creative name, uh, this is Cryogaster polar clavis. As you can probably see from the picture, this frog is quite small and it's also very warty. And that's exactly what polar clavis means. Polar small, clavis wart. This is the small warty frog. They can't all be coyatles. Uh, we then had Cragasta portilioensis from the little town of Portilio del Reo, portilioensis of Portilio. And finally, Cragasta rubinus, rubinus referring to precious gems because the hillsides this frog comes from is famous for its garnet mines. So six new species of frog. And as you can see, these are all really, really small frogs, all measuring at less than 13 millimeters total body length. And this makes these Mexico's very, very smallest frogs. Probably Craugaster rubinus with adults at 10.8 millimeters long total body length is probably Mexico's very, very smallest frog. Some of these other specimens might have adults um, slightly smaller that we just haven't found yet, but it appears the current, current title goes to Craugaster rubinus of Mexico's smallest frog. So we discovered six new species of frog. We went ahead and described them, but what else did we find? What else did our research reveal about these frogs evolution? So one thing we found is that all our small species of frog are more closely related to each other than they are to any of the large species. So they all share one single common ancestor. And so that suggests to us that there was a single miniaturization event in the history of this group. There was an ancestral small frog and then that diversified into all these different small forms around Mexico. We then also found some interesting things looking at the skeletons of frogs, looking at the CT scans we got of our frog skeletons. 
And so here we have as an example, one of our large frogs. So as an example of what the large frog skeletons look like, we have Cryogaster mexicanus. Example of what the small frog skeletons look like, we have Cryogaster rubinus. And you can see from the large skeletons, these are nice robust skeletons. You can see that that skull is nicely fused together. And this is in direct contrast to some of our smaller specimens. You can see that skull isn't fused up. You can see there's big gaps in that skull of our small frog. You might be able to see as well that at the ends of the limbs, that those aren't fully fused up either. They're missing what we call the limb epithesis. So the lack of ossification of the skeletons of our smaller frogs. And this, again, this appears to relate to how these frogs get smaller. It's an example of this heterochrony of this pedomorphosis we mentioned earlier. So in a lack of ossification in the skeleton is something we might expect to see in a very, very young frog, in a juvenile frog, but here we're seeing it in an adult frog. As that relates to how this small body size evolves, this small body size evolves by truncating that development, by causing these frogs to stop growing at a very early stage of their development. So they have the small body size and they retain that juvenile kind of skeleton. We also found a potential association between elevation and body size as well something new that hadn't previously been seen in other species of small frogs. So we found all of our large frogs shown here in blue occur at quite high elevations, they occur up in the mountains, whereas all of our small frogs occurring at low elevations, occurring down in the lowlands. So we can look at a map of Mexico, a topological map. So we have on this map here, these dark areas are in the highlands and these pale areas are in the lowlands. We have our small frogs in yellow and our large frogs in blue. So you can see our small frogs in yellow there are mainly found in these lowland areas. And if we look at some of the species, we have lots and lots of specimens for. So we have Cryogaster mexicanus, Cryogaster pygmaeus. What a mexicanus is a large species, pygmaeus is a small species. And we had hundreds of specimens for these species of frogs. And so we could compare the different elevations these two species came from. So we found Cryogaster pygmaeus occurs at significantly lower elevations than Cryogaster mexicanus. So there's supposed to be a link between this body size and elevation. And so we don't exactly know why that is. We know body size is associated with living in the leaf litter. This small body size is an adaptation to living in the leaf litter. But here it's potentially might also be an adaptation to something else, an adaptation to living at these lower elevations, perhaps. Now, this is a, a sort of a new question. So our research um, answers some questions, but it presents new ones as well. So what is this link? What is this causal link between body size and elevation? So that's something we could look at further in the future to try and figure out what's, this, what's going on here and does this occur in other animals, does this occur in other frogs. So we found our new species of frog, we describe those new species of frog, we give them names and we can find things out about their evolution. What are the other implications of describing new species of frog? Well, someone who works, has worked in the conservation sector with my sort of conservation hat on, one of the really important things about discovering new species, about discovering new species of frog, is trying to figure out what this means for their conservation. We can't protect the species if we don't know it's there in the first place, but if we can identify that a new species is there when we hadn't found out before, we can look at what threats it might face and try and make sure that it doesn't go extinct just as soon as we find it. And so frogs are a very threatened group of animals. There's lots and lots of different major threats to frogs all over the world. So huge threats include things like habitat loss. Uh, there's a very high rates of deforestation in Mexico. As we've mentioned, our frogs live in the leaf litter of forests. And so if those forests are cleared, we also clear that leaf litter and that removes the habitat for these frogs. Climate change is also a particularly big risk for frogs. And so as climate changes, the habitat in which the animal lives may no longer remain suitable. Now, if you're a very large species and you can move quite long distances, you might be able to follow that habitat. You might be able to track your habitat uh, as that climate changes and somewhere else in the country might be suitable. If you're a very small species that can't move very far, if that habitat changes, you probably can't move fast enough to track it and that can lead to your extinction. And so amphibians and other species that can't move very far are potentially very, very vulnerable to habitat change. So we have here, we're returning to our diversity maps of amphibians in Mexico. And here we can see how those are expected to change from the year 2000 into 2080 uh, with climate change. And you can see that the expansion of these white areas, these areas where we have no amphibian diversity, where we expect no amphibians to survive, we can see how those expand as climates predict to change. So we can see how climate change is predicted to cause local extinctions of amphibian species. You can also see how these cooler areas, these blue colors expand at the expense of our warmer areas, our reds and our um, oranges. And again, this shows how amphibian diversity is expected to drop across a lot of Mexico in response to climate change. <clears throat> 
Disease is also a really big problem for frogs as well. So we're just coming out of the end or still somewhat in the midst of our own pandemic, but amphibians have actually been living through their own pandemic since the 1990s, a disease called chytridiomycosis. This is a fungal disease called by the, caused by the fungal pathogen Batrachochytridum dendrobotitis. And what this fungus does is it infects the skin of frogs and it causes the formation of these painful lesions. It causes that skin to thicken. Now, frogs use their skin as an exchange layer. They use that to exchange water, use that to filter various things out of their blood. But if that, if that skin is damaged, if it starts to form these lesions, it no longer works as this filtration surface. It can no longer work as an exchange surface, and therefore these frogs die. And that's what's been happening all over the world due to this disease, chytridiomycosis. And so here we have a map of this chytrid fungus all over the world, and you can see this is truly a pandemic. What we've got here in these different colored dots are the different strains of this disease, the different strains of chytrid. And you can see that it's found all over the world in various different strains. And this has had devastating effects on amphibian species worldwide. So what, what our circles with frogs in here show is the relative number of species for each country that have undergone catastrophic declines. And so you can see that in Central America, and if we look at Central America and Mexico, you can see how we have really, really high numbers of catastrophic declines in those countries in response to this disease. And so what this graphic is showing is that we have um, more than 10 species in Mexico, more than 10 species in most um, Central American countries that have been extinct or almost gone extinct due to this disease. So frogs are facing a lot of threats worldwide. So what can this work? What can the discovery of some new species of frogs, how can we identify particular threats to our new species and how can we tackle them? So one thing we can do is look where our frogs come from. So again, we have yet another map of Mexico. And on this one, we have these different colors and shapes represent where our different species of frogs in this group come from. So you can see some of our species are quite uh, widespread. So we have in these blue triangles, Cragaster mexicanus, and these yellow circles, Cragaster pygmaeus. And you can see how these are spread across Mexico. They have quite a wide range in Mexico. We find them in lots of places. But some of our newly described species, for example, Cragaster rubinus, shown as the little red triangle, is only found in one location. So it appears a lot of our newly described species are what we call microendemics. So an endemic species is one that only occurs within a single country, but a microendemic is one that only occurs in one really, really small area within a country. So it appears that Cragaster rubinus and some of the other frogs in this group are microendemics. They only occur in one single hillside, in one single forest. And this leads them very, very vulnerable to habitat change. If that hillside is uh, deforested, if say uh, where Cragaster rubinus comes from is very famous for its garnet mines, if those mines were to expand across the hillside that this frog comes from, that is the world habitat of that frog gun gone and that's it extinct. And so the obvious solution to that is to try and think about how we can protect these areas and we can protect those habitats to make sure these frogs don't go extinct. So one way to think about how we can do this is to look at where we might want to prioritize protection for this group. And so again, we go to our map and we find that we have some areas where we have lots of different species living closely together, what we call diversity hotspots. We have in central Guerrero and in South Oaxaca, areas where we have lots of these species living in a rather small area. So these might be the most effective places to prioritize conservation. These might be the kind of places where we'd want to establish protected areas to protect the largest number of species in the smallest possible area. So we can see how good a job Mexican protected areas are currently doing at protecting this group. So on maybe our fifth or sixth different map of Mexico, here we have shown in green Mexican protected areas and we have our colors and shapes. These are where our frogs come from. And you can see that if we look at our diversity hotspots, these protected areas aren't doing a particularly good job at the moment of protecting the diversity of frogs in this group. They're not doing a very good job of protecting the Craugaster mexicanus species series. And so one way we might like to go forward be to work with partners in Mexico, work with the Mexican government, work with Mexican conservation organizations, work with our partners at universities in Mexico in order to try and establish and bulk up the protection of some of these priority areas. You can see in a central Guerra there um, that we've got a couple of teeny tiny protected areas. And these are community run protected areas. These are around little towns run by the communities that live alongside these frogs. And so our probably first port of call here would be to work with these communities, work alongside these communities to help them establish more protected areas and to help them improve the protection of those existing protected areas. And hopefully if we do that, we can make sure these frogs don't go extinct just as soon as we've discovered them. So to take away from these sort of talk, this, to some takeaways of what we found was we discovered six species of frogs new to science. 
And these frogs are really, really small. They're miniaturized, and that is an adaptation to living in this wet forest leaf litter, to living beneath the leaves. And these, many of these new species are micro-endemics. They only occur in one really, really small area, but that makes them very, very vulnerable to habitat change. So conservation action is surely solely needed to make sure that there's a future for these frogs. That's pretty much all from me, but of course this work wasn't done just done by me, it was done by a fantastic team of co-authors who helped out, including Professor Jason Head sitting down there at the front, so thank you to those wonderful co-authors. As I mentioned already, most of this work was on museum specimens, so we had frogs sent to us from all over the world, but we were particularly helped by these three big institutions who sent us literally hundreds of frogs. So thank you to the American Museum of Natural History, the Field Museum in Chicago, and the University of Texas at Arlington. And of course, uh, the biggest and an extra special thank has to go to our many colleagues and friends in Mexico and the people who live alongside these frogs who are so helpful and have put so much work into helping with this project as well. So thank you all um, to all of them. Thank you to you for listening to me ramble on about tiny frogs. I think it's over to you for any questions. Thanks so much. Any questions? So we have a microphone. So uh, if you yeah, start speaking once you've got the microphone, but yes, at the front here. Thank you. Great talk. Okay. Um, so um, how objective are your speciation criteria? So, you know, is there any subjectivity in there? If you apply slightly different criteria, might you have found five new species or seven new species? Yeah, so we, um, we, so when we want to define a species, we actually have to come up with some specific uh, boundaries by which we say, you know, these are, this is where one species lies, this is where another species lies. And so uh, to do that, we try and make sure that our species criteria are consistent with what is done for frogs in general, uh, as consistent as possible. And so the criteria we used is, we used a couple of different criteria. And so if our frog satisfies enough of them, then it's designated as a distinct species. So that's based on, we look at things like um, genetic distances. So we've sequenced the genes for those frogs and we can look at how different specimens are within a species versus, versus outside of a species. So we have a distinct like numerical genetic distance that if it's greater than that, then we can say it's a distinct species. We can look at the evolutionary history and make sure that these frogs are um, what we call monophyletic. And, and so that they have um, that independently evolving groups. And so, yeah, so we have some very objective um, species to answer your question more concisely, we have some very objective criteria based on things like genetic distances. And that's how we're designating these species. Yes. Um, if they don't have a tadpole stage, um, what sort of size of eggs do they produce or are they viviparous and what sort of numbers and sizes of eggs do they produce, the, 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 the tiny frogs? Yeah, so amongst um, direct developing frogs, we typically see slightly larger eggs. So they usually produce larger but fewer eggs. And so this is due to kind of, um, it's a, effectively a greater investment in each individual young. So we're, we're putting more investment into the eggs. They've got a larger egg. We're having um, more investment by the parents in each individual. Uh, so if you're producing lots and lots of eggs and having lots and lots of tadpoles, it's quite a low investment in each individual. So you, you're throwing out loads and hoping at least some of them survive. Whereas in the direct developing frogs, we usually see fewer eggs, um, but they're bigger eggs, there's more energy put into them. So it's uh, more investment in an individual. So you're expecting more of them to survive. So yeah, bigger eggs and smaller numbers. Yes, back there. Thank you very much. It's that's a sort of a just a, another to qualify that last question. I think the question was size. I was intrigued to actually ask what these guys eat, uh, and therefore, if you can also answer how small a baby frog would be and what it would eat, would be quite interesting. Yeah. So we actually we got some interesting insights into what these frogs were eating from our CT scans. So we threw those frogs in the CT scanner, and as well as getting the skeleton, we also sometimes got what they what their last meal was. So we can see from the CT scan what was in the stomach as well. Most of these frogs appear to be eating ants, so they're potentially ant specialists, and that feeds in with what we know about a lot of other small species of frogs. So a lot of species of these really tiny frogs from around the world, um, particularly in Indonesia, we have a group called the micro hylids, which means small mouth, um, and they're ant specialists. And it appears these frogs may well be ant specialists as well. Uh, the juveniles of these, uh, the thing about these frogs is their young aren't that much smaller than the adults. 
because they're hatching, they have these big eggs and they're hatching from the egg and they might grow a little bit, but as, as was sort of mentioned, we have this pedamorphosis going on, their development is truncated. And so they sort of, they grow, but they don't grow very much. They kind of stop growing very early and that's how they get to that very small body size. So the juveniles are probably doing a very, very similar thing to the adult. They're probably mainly eating ants. We also found some um, really tiny millipedes in their stomach as well. But yeah, so probably ant and myriapod specialists. Sorry, we need the, the speaker so the people online. So on the, okay, sorry. On, so the, the, you say they're quite big as juveniles. What like four mil? If they're gro fully grown as yeah. So 10. I think the um, so we had some juvenile specimens of some of our newly described species, and I think the very very smallest one we had was four point eight millimeters long as a juvenile. So yeah, and that's yeah we wouldn't expect to find them much smaller than that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, thinking yeah four five mil, very small. <laughs> Yeah, I was just struck by your map um, over the next 50 years, how much the kind of suitable areas in Mexico are going to change due to climate change. And if you were focusing on certain hotspots at the moment, are those likely to, in 10, 20 years time, no longer be suitable given climate change projections? And so do we need to be taking account of, you know, climate change, potentially moving them um, to areas that could be more suitable if you wanted to safeguard them in the longer term? Uh, yeah, that's actually... Uh... A really good question because that's a lot of what my PhD thesis focus on in uh, with reptiles and protected areas in Australia. Um, and so it's all well and good sort of protecting an area now, but of course, if that area will be completely unsuitable for an organism in a hundred years, uh, then uh, is it worth investing all this time and money in? And so um, should we be forecasting where we put protected areas? Should we be looking at what areas would be suitable in the future and trying to designate what might be something that is a bit more, um, has a, more of a long-term suitability. We might particularly want to focus on what we call refugia. So these might be specific areas within the environment that remain suitable over a really, really long time period. And so we can do that by looking at things like climate change models and what we call ecological niche models. Um, so uh, what habitat is suitable for an organism um, based on the kind of based on the climate so we can actually build these models that kind of look at that um and so yeah the answer is i think absolutely uh, and that's part of what i look at in my phd thesis yeah can i ask if there's uh, any application to your research i mean do any of these frogs produce any poisons that could have use human use in drugs uh, medicinal uh, use so so we've not yet looked at um sort of the physiology of these frogs so we don't really know what their skin is producing but the answer is um almost certainly a lot of work has been done uh, with frogs with the various skin secretions with the various chemicals they produce um, on producing various pharmaceuticals um so with particularly things like the poison dart frogs or the dendrobatids a lot of work's being done there on looking at how um, their skin secretions, how their poisons might be used as various painkillers. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for these frogs, uh, honestly, we don't know, um, but people should be looking at this sort of thing. It's a really interesting field of study. And it's one of the reasons why it's so important to be protecting biodiversity. So you know, biodiversity has so much inherent value, but there also is potentially a real applied value for people. But if everything goes extinct before we can see what that is, um, then that'd be a real waste. Um, so, yeah. And secondly, I understand that there are some ponds in England where uh, the frogs don't, they, they don't have tadpoles, they don't develop because of the composition of the water. I believe there's a, a, a pond near Thornton in Lonsdale like this. So why is that? Oh, that's a, that's a rather specific question. I'm not sure if I can answer that, I'm afraid. Um, I could, I'm sure I could look it up for you and try to figure that out, but that, that might be a little bit beyond my expertise, I'm afraid. Yes, at the back there. Hello, Tom. Um, the miniaturization, does that have an effect on the lifespan as well? How, how long do they live, these tiny frogs? So that is, again, another excellent question that um, I can't answer because we don't know. These sort of uh, work on these really small species is fairly new. 
and a lot of the th we, we actually know very little about the lives of these frogs and with most miniaturized frogs around the world this is almost as far as most people have got we kind of have recognized them we're only just starting to identify a lot of these species but not we don't really know much about um how these frogs breed how long they live um with these frogs we don't even know if they croak or not uh, because we've not people haven't had enough time in the field to actually investigate that so we don't even know if they make what sound they make um and so uh, so much more work could be done on actually figuring out what these frogs are doing i think these these frogs particularly ecologically really interesting as i mentioned before they potentially have these giant population sizes they're potentially really really important for ecosystems because everything eats them um but no one's done the work um so yeah, so if you want to donate large amounts of money to the University of Cambridge so this work can be done, then uh, please do. Back there. Thank you for that excellent talk. Thank question you. about, partly connected to the first question about speciation. Mm -hmm. Have you, I'm going to be a bit specific, apologies for this. Um, have you looked at the mitochondrial DNA in these, in doing the speciation, the, the different species? Number two, the reason why I asked this is about partly related to the calcium balance. You know, you had a lovely image on how the bones are not completely formed. And it seems like you might have in your hand a model to link those two things, the dynamics between calcium flow in cells to bone formation to the environment. And we've always been looking for model systems where you can actually link environment to cell biology. If you know. So, so, um, so yeah, in terms of the mitochondrial DNA, so we have within a cell, we have a nucleus. So it's the center of the cell where most of our DNA is. And we also have our mitochondria that are producing kind of the energy for the cell. And that also has um, DNA within it. And so we have these two different kind of sources of DNA within a cell, which can evolve separately. They can have different kind of evolutionary trajectories. And so uh, it's important that if we're looking at things like speciation, we look at both of them. So to answer your question, yes, so we looked at both genes from the mitochondria and genes from the nucleus. And part of our species de designation criteria was making sure that um, basically those two sources of DNA are telling the same kind of story. Um, so, so yes, to answer your question, yeah, we did look at the mitochondria um, and uh, that uh, the linking the mitochondrial DNA to potentially your calcium deposits, um, would be fascinating yeah really interesting model uh, model system again i think there's a lot that could be done with these small species of frog there's a lot going on in terms of how this heterochrony works how development is truncated that answers some really fundamental questions about biology about how development works about aging um, about how genes are regulating all this sort of thing um so yeah so it certainly would be a, a really interesting model system um so yeah if uh I'm more than happy to hearing suggestions for that. And if you want to speak more afterwards, been more than welcome to. Yes. Um, I think in the introduction, um, I heard that you'd worked at Chester Zoo yes. for a bit, which is my local zoo. And there are some pretty small frogs there. And I wondered, are, are any of these frogs there or are they in other zoos? I uh, know. So uh, there are, as far as I'm aware, none of this group are in captivity anywhere. Uh, there's you know, only certain species, we, uh, only so much space within captivity for conservation programs to have different animals. As far as I'm aware, none of the Craugaster Mexicanus group are in any collections kind of worldwide. May I think maybe Craugaster Mexicanus, which is kind of one of the big ones, which is very, very common, um, is probably around in some places. Uh, but again, that that next level of conservation work, the level of having things in captivity, building captive populations for reintroduction in places, uh, that stage hasn't yet been reached with this group. Um, it's kind of much further down the line. Um, but I think that that is, you know, going forward is establishing protected areas. More work needs to be done on these species to actually figure out how in trouble are they? Are our micro endemics, are they in need of being translocated to a new region? Are they going to go extinct imminently? Um, so yeah, again, much more work could be done to figure out yeah, if we should be having them in cap captivity at all, and if that level of kind of intense captive conservation work should be going ahead. Oh, um, terrific talk. I was just wondering how one deals with a frog pandemic. Uh, that's a very good question, and one that is keeping much of the frog science community very, very busy. Um, so yeah, kit, the chytrid is a, is a really um, tricky question. So this is it's a fungal disease, and it lives in soil, it lives in uh, rivers, uh, and 
once it's there, you basically can't get rid of it. And so there's been a lot of work to figure out, can we scrub this sort of pathogen from the environment in the same way that we've been, um, you know, we'd use alcohol gel wipes to kind of wipe down a classroom or something to get rid of uh, COVID. People have been figuring out, well, can we do this um, you know, in the wild? Can we get rid of this fungus in the wild? And so there's been some work particularly done um, in uh, the Iberian Peninsula on figuring out it's actually working on these midwife toads uh, that live down kind of around Spain and Portugal because uh, they've been very badly affected by this disease. In their breeding ponds, can we get rid of this fungus? And the answer is kind of, but it effectively involves emptying a load of bleach into the environment. Um, not, not quite, but yeah, pretty much that is what, what they're doing. So like, yes, they can if they fill the entire environment full of bleach and then put everything back and that sort of works. And so at a landscape scale, at a country scale, that's not really practical. And so most of the work that's being done on Kitchard is looking at kind of the very local scale. So a project I was working on in Chester Zoo was with uh, the mountain chicken frog, um, so-called because it lives in mountain and tastes like chicken, um, lives in um, Montserrat and Dominica, and they've been really badly affected by Kitchard fungus, and they're pretty much extinct in the wild. And so we've been doing work to actually put them back into the wild. But the problem is that they're extinct in the wild because of a disease, but the disease is still there you can't really just put them back because they'll all die again. And so we've been trying to come up with solutions to that. One thing we found is that we can create protective breeding ponds for those guys. And so the fungus does badly when it gets, when water is warm. And so these frogs can, if they go in a warm bath, that kills all the fungus on them. And so work's being done on Dominica and Montserrat to create effectively hot tubs for these frogs fed by um, warm groundwater from the volcanic activity. As it's been found with re-releasing those frogs, they self-treat the fungus by, when they get infected with it, they go and find a bath. But these are all small scale solutions. So we, things we can protect, um, protect potentially critically endangered species, we can protect key areas on a small scale to deal with this disease. But at a global level, there appears to be no major solution. There is some work that is starting to find that maybe some populations developing a resistance to this disease. And so it, we could be hopeful and hopeful maybe lots of different frogs will eventually evolve resistance. Um, but that again appears to be in a lot of isolated populations. It appears to be in frogs that are, are like very, very hardy, have very big populations already. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really uh, interesting question that's keeping a lot of people very busy. How do we tackle it? Um, we can try lots of different ways, but it's, it, it's really, really hard. Right, well, if we're, if we're out of questions, then um, I guess, yeah, just up to me to thank you all again for listening.